So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the presence of non-rivalrous, non-excludable goods and why they cause a market failure. And really kind of set up an example to kind of see the problem that these end up bringing up to society on a whole in the market. Let's, uh, let's take a look at a bit of a situation. Let's presume that, hey, I were to offer everybody in the class a bonus 5%, right? So, hey, if you were going to sit at 75% to finish the course, boom, I'm going to push you up to an 80%. But I'll only do this if I get 10 unique, high quality, that is, right? These are papers that I would rate, I'd give them a grade of 80% or higher. So at least 10 high quality, 10 page research essays about why global leaders have a difficult time sticking to their commitments for greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so if I were to do this, would everybody be better off? Yeah, right? Everybody in the class would be better off if I could get 10 of these papers. There's 150 or so people in the class. Well, hey, that's not very many who have to write this, 10 out of 150. So everybody is significantly better off if this happens. What's the problem though? Who's gonna write this, right? Who are these 10 gonna be? If I only get nine papers, well, that doesn't work, right? We need to have 10 papers. If I get 11, okay, that's cool, but we need at least 10. So here's the problem. Would you incur that cost for everyone else to get the benefit? You might, that 5% might be worth enough for you that you would do it. But the trouble is, is that it becomes unlikely to find the 10 people that we would need in order to incur to in order to incur this cost for the society's benefit, right? Society being the entire class. This here is an example of many types of goods in the world around us, where one, two, a handful of people bear the cost, bear the burden of getting this done for all of society to get the benefit. The problem is, is that we tend to be pretty poor at actually letting markets create how often this should be. Um, how much we should provide, and we'll really get to see that as we move into things. So let's launch into this. Let's take a look at what exactly we mean by non-rivalrous, what exactly we mean by non-excludable for our different types of goods. So let's start off by defining our distinction between rivalrous and excludable. What exactly do we mean by that? So to start off with rivalrousness, so a good is rival, if when you consume the good, you obtain the entire benefit. So that is a good is rival when the marginal private benefit equals the marginal social benefit. If these two are one and the same, well, then the good is rival. The entire benefit being, re being redeemed from consumption of this good is being felt by the private individual. Right? Example of this, well, most of the goods we've talked about so far. Right? Cookies, cookies are rival. As you consume a cookie, well, that private benefit that you receive is one of the same as the social benefit because you got all the benefit and society is one of the same. For a non rivalrous good, well, for a non rivalrous good, in this case here, what we end up witnessing is that the marginal private benefit is less than the marginal social benefit. And the rationale behind this being that, okay, because it's non-rivalrous, you get your benefit from consuming this good or service, but hey, even though you consumed it, other people can still consume it, other people can still have access to it. And so in this case here, just because you accessed a good or service, it does not prevent other people from accessing this good or service. Um, example of this would be like a swimming pool. So just because you went to a swimming pool, you got your private benefit from going to a swimming pool, well, other people can still access that swimming pool. Other people can still go swimming. By you swimming, it does not preclude their ability to swim. So that's our non-rivalrous goods. What else do we have going on here? Well, we have excludability. So excludable means that you have to pay for it, right? That we can actually make you pay for this and by having to pay for it while well, you face the cost. In that case there, for an excludable good, it is typically the case such that your marginal private cost is one and the same as the marginal social cost. 
So, okay, in that case there, you have to pay for this, and therefore your cost of consuming this is the same as the social cost. What you have to keep in mind is that excludable is really asking, is it easy to actually charge a price for this? Is it easy to make people pay in order to utilize this? And such that that cost to utilize it is that marginal private or marginal social cost. Non-excludable then. Non-excludable is cases where we don't get to charge a cost for it. We don't get to charge a price. Or at least it's not, we could charge a cost, we could charge a price, but it's not feasibly easy to do. It's very difficult to charge a price, right? In this case here, people can consume this good without paying for it. If they can consume this without paying for it, they get the benefit without paying a cost, right? As they get this benefit while well, they end up Ultimately, society pays for this, so we would have marginal private cost less than our marginal social cost. So, okay, again, we have a bunch of stuff going on here. We don't really need to focus in too much on that. Really what we need to get on, um, kind of our idea on, is that rival, if I eat it, you can't. Non-rival, I can eat it, and so can you. Right, we both get benefit from the same thing. Excludable, I can't eat it unless I pay for it. Non-excludable, I can eat it, I can enjoy it, even if I didn't pay for it. That's really our big idea with each of these. What we can then do is we can kind of take them, we can put them together, and we can create a grid such that we would have the following intersection points. So we'd be looking at rival, um, Sorry, let's let's not put rival there. We'd be looking at excludable versus non-excludable. We'd be looking at rival versus non-rival. And what I'm going to put here for non-rival is I'm going to say non-rival up to capacity. Because there's some capacity, right, in our swimming pool example is that eventually, as you keep adding more and more and more people into that swimming pool, eventually there's that final person that you add, where by them being in the pool, by them swimming, you no longer get to swim. We can't add anybody else. That is, by them being that last person to enter, there's no room for anybody else to get in. So we would have hit capacity, the capacity of that non-rival good. Okay. So let's start off in the top left corner. Let's take a look at goods that are both rival and excludable. We would call these kind of goods, we would call them private goods. And these goods, these are really what the focus of the course has been on so far. Hey, if I'm consuming it, I get all the benefit. It's excludable, so the price I pay is my private cost and social the social cost. That is, these private goods, they are typically allocatively efficient allocatively efficient. That is, there's no market failure occurring here. Typically with our private goods, we're allocatively efficient. The market can reach that allocatively efficient outcome on its own. We have no problems occurring. Right, examples would be cookies, t-shirts, cheeseburgers, all of these kind of things would be cases of private goods. Well, okay, if these goods don't cause a market failure, let's, let's remind ourselves before we get into the other ones, what exactly is a market failure? So again, to remind ourselves, a market failure, a market failure occurs anytime when the market on its own cannot reach allocative efficiency. That is, for some Q, for some quantity exchanged, they cannot get to a point such that the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. That is, typically, we'll write this in another way. We'll say, oh, sorry, they're not allocatively efficient, so they cannot achieve that. Or very similarly, they cannot achieve price equal to marginal social cost. This is typically what it ends up translating into. Marginal social benefit not equal to, but 
price not equal to marginal social cost. So, okay, if that's our kind of case for a market failure, well, let's take a look at this next one. Let's jump over and let's take a look at a non-excludable good. So non-excludable, we would call these a common resource good. Common resource. And really for common resource goods, these are our natural resources. We could be taking a look at forestry. We could be taking a look at oil and gas. So we'll go oil and gas. We could be taking a look at fishing, hunting, all of our natural wild resources. These are good examples of common resource goods. Problem with these is their rival. So, okay, if I eat it, you can't eat it. If I cut down a tree, you can't cut down a tree. But they're non excludable, meaning to me individually, the price to cut down a tree is zero, right? So, okay, what's our problem here? Our problem is that my marginal private cost is zero, right? Because I don't face a cost. It is non-excludable. You cannot make me, can, there's no easy way to make me have to pay to cut down a tree. I can sneak into the woods. I can cut down a tree. I can burn it for a campfire. I get all that benefit from the campfire and I didn't pay a cost. Well, the issue with this is that if everybody started doing that, if everybody was cutting down trees for their own campfire, well, what would very quickly happen is we'd run out of trees, right? Hey, I'd be equating my marginal private cost with my marginal private benefit. I'd be consuming a lot of trees or I'd be fishing a lot of fish. I'd be dragging everything out because, hey, every fish I don't catch, that other fisher will. So as a result, we overuse this resource. We continue to use it, we continue to use it, continue, continue, continue until the resource collapses, right? We will use it to the point of exhaustion because we will keep using it, right? We will equate our marginal private cost to our marginal private benefit. And hey, that's gonna be a lot of fish to catch before that extra benefit from an extra fish is zero to me. That's a lot, right? So we end up just over utilizing this resource to the point of collapse. Well, the problem is, is that as we use this, as we fish more and more, as we log more and more, it becomes more and more difficult for the next guy to find a tree to log. It becomes more and more difficult for the next guy to actually find a fish to fish, right? And so in that case there, although the marginal private cost is zero, the marginal social cost is positive. And so what we need to do in order to correct for this is we need to actually impose a price onto this market. We need to actually charge people to cut down trees. We need to charge people to fish. We need to put something in place such that we can set this marginal private cost equal to this marginal social cost. In that way there, we can obtain a level of utilization of this resource, right? How many trees we cut down, how many fish we pull out, such that the resource does not collapse, such that we don't exhaust it in entirety, but that we can sustainably use it, right? And so in some way, we want to get our marginal private cost equal to this marginal social cost. And the way we would do that is we would put in essentially a tax. Although quite often these prices are referred to as royalties, right? And in that case there in Canada, if you want to mine for oil or mine for coal or any other natural resource, you pay royalties to the crown. And that's just a way of saying that you pay a tax to the government for the right to access those resources. In forestry, you pay for stumpage fees, right? You pay so much for every tree you cut down. And that money there goes to the government because you're using the government's, you're using Canada's resources. And so what would otherwise just be free to utilize and would result in exhaustion by charging a price, by charging a price, a royalty, well, we can set private cost equal to social cost. And thus we can obtain a situation such that the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. And thus we can reach allocative efficiency by introducing a price. So a tax, a royalty is how we would do it. So to recap, problem with common resource goods, we'll use them to the point of exhaustion, right? To the point where they collapse. In order to fix that, we need to align the private cost with the social cost. 
And the way that we align that is with a tax. And typically we put a royalty. We make firms pay for every tree they cut down. So problem, solution. Again, how do we do that? You need a strong government, right? You need to have a government that can intervene and do this. If government doesn't have power to do that, if the government is seen as weak and you can just sneak around them and cut down trees anyways, this won't be too effective and people will just continue to fish outside of where the government can patrol, continue to cut down trees where they're not going to get caught. And then you run into problems. You need a strong government. You need institutions and a society that respects the law of or, um, rule and law of order. So big part with that. Let's jump over to the bottom left here. Bottom left, this guy here, so goods that are excludable, so that is I can prevent somebody else from accessing it, but they're non-rival. In this case here, we would call these guys club goods. So in club goods, this would be things like, uh, we could say museums. Uh, we could say pools. Right, we talked about pools already with this whole idea of being non-rival. We could talk about roads, highways, bridges, tunnels, all of these kind of situations there. Um, these are all club goods. And really the big, pay, the big problem with club goods is this whole up to capacity situation. So the first bit is, okay, they're non-rival. Let's think about, let's think about a highway. Okay, typically with a highway, right? And you're like, okay, but wait, highways, roads, they're not excludable. We don't charge a price for those. No, we don't, but we could, right? It'd be very easy to put in a toll situation and charge a price for this highway. But let's take a look at kind of a traditional highway here in the West, at least, where most highways, they have a price of zero, right? That is, we have our marginal private cost of zero. That is, it's free to drive on the highway. It doesn't cost you anything to merge on. And then kind of the big benefit with this is that, hey, as long as we are not at our capacity, it doesn't cost me anything to merge on. And by me utilizing this good, well, hey, I can utilize this good. You can also utilize this good. We can both drive on the road at the same time. So just because I'm using it, well, so can you. So my marginal social cost is also zero. So, hey, this, this looks good, right? Price of zero, private cost of zero, social cost of zero. Those two are equal. Hey, we're allocatively efficient. Allocatively efficient. Things look good, right? Things look good in this case here. Highway, it's not congested, we're not at capacity, so no cost for me to go on. By me being on the highway, I'm not preventing you, so social cost is zero. Social cost, same as price, everybody's happy. Okay, problem in this scenario, the private market, the free market, would never on its own build highways, right? There's no profit maximizing firm that would be able to build highways and maximize profit at a price of zero. So our problem is our free market would not produce these, right? We would not provide highways and have a price of zero attached to them. So that'd be a problem. Our free market would want to charge a positive price. If they charge a positive price, well, then we no longer have this allocative efficiency. We have another problem with this, though. Our other problem is once we hit capacity. So once we hit capacity, so we'll go at and beyond capacity well now okay our price is still zero so the cost for me to get onto this highway is zero but now it's rush hour right now it's approaching rush hour and that is the highway is actually full of cars and by you merging onto this highway you're now actually preventing somebody else from accessing it by you getting onto this highway, somebody else now cannot. You're making their commute time longer. Potentially more vehicles on there, on that kind of stop and go kind of situation, more likely to get an accident. All of that gives us a marginal social cost, which is greater than zero, right? 
Now your actions by you merging on, by you taking up that last spot on the highway, well, you're now preventing somebody else. You're incurring extra cost onto society. What we notice now is that these two are no longer equal. Price no longer equals marginal social cost. That is, we would have a market failure. So here's the solution. We have a positive social cost. We have free price. Well, how do we fix this? Well, quite easy. We begin to charge tolls, right? In the case of a highway, you begin to charge tolls. You begin to charge people in order to utilize the highway. But here's where club goods get really tricky. We would want to charge tolls. So we'd want something like price greater than zero, such that that is equal to our marginal social cost greater than zero. So, okay, cool. We can do that. We can set price equal to marginal social cost such that they're both the same, some value bigger than zero. And again, we could have allocative efficiency. Cool. Great. That works during rush hour. What happens once rush hour is over and we get back to this point on the highway where it's no longer busy? Well, when it's no longer busy, it should be that once again, price equals zero. So we have like this two problems going on here. When we're under capacity, highways should be free. Once we begin to hit this capacity, once we begin to have a lot of demand to use this, well, our price needs to rise. Problem is, is that we don't do this very well. So that is ideally what we need to have to fix this club good problem is we need variable pricing. Let's, let's write that down. We need variable pricing, right? We need kind of this surge pricing. We need to charge a higher price as demand surges. We need to charge a lower price or potentially free when demand falls. The problem is traditionally we don't do this. Traditionally with any highway, with any bridge, any tunnel that we do toll, we either toll it all the time, which would be inefficient over here, or we don't ever toll it, which is then inefficient once we're at rush hour. So what you need is that variable tolling system. And these do exist in many places in the world where, hey, as it gets busier, as more and more people start to merge onto the highway, the toll starts to increase. It starts to go more and more. And it's a little at an exit. It'll say, hey, if you want to stay on the highway, you're going to be charged this amount of money. Alternatively, you can exit. And in that way there, people make their own decision. Hey, do I want to pay and be able to drive fast on the highway? Or do I just want to exit, maybe take a little bit longer and save that money? In this way here, we can equate price to marginal social cost and we can have an allocatively efficient situation. So, okay, let, let's recap club goods. Problem with them, when we're below capacity, the free market never wants to provide them because they cannot provide them and make any money. If they do try to provide them, well, they can provide them at capacity or beyond capacity, but now they have an incentive to not make as much to kind of keep things congested in order to continue to charge a positive price. So, okay, the free market fails to provide these club goods in a very good way. Now, the public market, government, government getting involved, government's good at this. Government's good at providing it for a price of zero, right? And most of our highways, most of our roads are provided in this kind of way. The problem is, is that they typically, governments don't start to charge when demand surges. We keep price at zero because we keep price at zero. Well, all of a sudden we have this market failure. Social costs rise, prices stay, and we overutilize it. We get congestion, we get traffic jams. Alternatively, if we do, if government do, does charge tolls for bridges, tunnels, highways, typically they'll charge a toll all the time. Meaning great, it's efficient when we have a surge in demand, but it's inefficient, it's a failure when we're in this situation here, when we have low demand, when it's not being utilized that much. Say middle of night, middle of day, those kind of situations where there's not a lot of vehicles on the road. So two kind of issues, complex issue here with our club goods. 
Let's take a look at our last one here, our public good. What's going on with our public good? Well, our public goods, these are situations that are both non-excludable and non-rivalrous. So you can't make me pay for it. And I can enjoy it as well as the next person. And big thing with that is I also get to enjoy it even if I don't pay for it. So some examples. Some examples of this are parks and green space. Right? I can enjoy a park. I can enjoy green space. Right? We can use uh, the Dallas waterfront as an example. I can enjoy that. Even just I can enjoy knowing that that's there without even going there. Just by driving by it, I'm like, oh, that is a beautiful view. I enjoy the fact that this is a park and not a massive development condo tower. Right? I get benefit from that, even though I paid nothing into it. So these public goods, these parks, these green spaces, non-rivalrous, non-excludable. What's, what's the problem with these guys? Our problem is free riders. Ah, terrible free riders. Problem is we're all free riders, right? We're all free riders. If I'll give them the option, like, hey, we're building this park. Do you want to donate in order to help us build it? Well, your reaction is typically going to be no, right? It's going to be no, or eh, if I do, I'm going to donate very little. And the reason being is because you know that you get benefit from this, even if somebody else pays for it. And so you being utility maximized and trying to get the most benefit, happiness, satisfaction you can for the lowest cost, you want somebody else to pay for this and you get that massive amount of benefit to yourself. And you can because it's not excludable. It's non rivalrous You both get to enjoy it. And so the problem here is that nobody wants to get this built. Nobody individually, sorry, everyone wants it built. No one's willing to face the costs to build it. Right, because no one's willing to face the costs. Everyone goes, ah, how about that guy pays the costs? We underprovide it. We underprovide it. Everybody maybe puts in a little bit because they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, I can get behind this, but they don't put in enough. So we either don't provide parks and green space, or we don't provide enough parks and green space to be socially optimal. How do we fix this problem? Well, we can fix this public good problem by having a strong government that is able to tax, oh, by being able to tax and transfer, right? So being able to say, hey guys, look, we know that you on your own want this park. We also know that you would never contribute to this park. So look, we're just gonna tax you and we will build this park for you. And it is in your own best interest, trust us. And they go and they do it and we're miserable. We complain about the tax, but in the end, we really love that park. Right. And so by having a strong government act on our behalf, we can overcome this free rider problem because through this government tax, the government mandates everybody to be involved, essentially, for everybody to contribute their fair share. So we can overcome this using a tax and transfer system for our public goods. Let's uh, let's go back and kind of talk about the uh, bridging that we looked at at the start of the video where I said, hey, hypothetically, everybody in the class gets plus 5% to their final grade. If we get 10 high quality essays written, right? This here's a public good problem. Everybody gets the benefit. Good luck coordinating 10 people to write a unique high quality essay. Right, that'd be very difficult. You might get a few people who say, hey, to me, the cost of writing an essay is worth this plus 5%. But to get enough people together to do that would be extremely difficult. You might only get eight, you might get five, you might get four people, right? Very unlikely to get all 10. As a result, even though from a society's viewpoint, everybody wins to do this, it'd be a very hard outcome to hit. What really you would want is you need to have somebody step up in class. You have to have a leader to kind of say, hey, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to have 10 people write this essay and the rest of us are going to contribute. The rest of us are going to help out and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to share the load so that we get this benefit together, recognizing the social good. Now, okay, attached to that, I said, hey, 
this essay would be based off of why world leaders have a failure, why they have such a hard time committing to their greenhouse gas targets. Well, let's talk about that rationale there. The rationale is because hitting their greenhouse gas targets, that is their level of pollution abatement. What was pollution abatement again? Pollution abatement, abatement fancy for reduction. So hitting their pollution reduction targets, why is this so hard? It's because pollution abatement, this guy here, this is a public good. The whole world gets the benefit if we abate pollution. Right? It's not just a localized benefit, it's the world that gets the benefit. So the problem is who's going to pay for it? Everybody goes and points fingers and says, yes, we want pollution to be abated. Yes, we need to hit these targets. How about you pay for it? Right? How about you incur the cost? You abate your pollution. Pollution abatement is expensive. Why don't you abate your pollution and then that way there we get the benefit? Right? This is problematic because yes, we could have a whole bunch of small countries all abate pollution, all at their own cost, and get total net benefit for the entire globe. But at the same time, these small countries, they go and they say, hey, they point to China. They say, hey, China, you're polluting a lot. If you were just to abate pollution, that would have a bigger effect than all of us. Or they point to the U.S. And they say, hey, U.S., you create, you're the world's largest economy. You create tons of pollution. If you would just abate pollution, there we go. Or they point to Canada. They say, hey, Canada, you are one of the worst polluters per capita. If you guys figured this out, hey, there we go. You guys incur the cost. We don't have to. And we get the same target, the same outcome. Right? This goes across the board now. Everybody's pointing fingers at somebody else saying, you need to act. You need to cut your pollution. You need to increase your pollution abatement targets. You need to face that cost. And hey, hey, the world will win. Well, without a strong world government, and arguably there's a lot of reasons against a strong world government, but without that, it becomes exceptionally difficult to force all of these countries around the world to commit and to hold to their commitments for pollution abatement because it's a public good. And every country has an incentive to free ride. Every country has an incentive to say, hey, hey, all of you, sure, you all hit your targets. I'm not going to. And you won't notice and we'll still get the same benefit. And that's the problem. That is the issue with this. So we have our different goods. We have well, non-rivalrous, non-excludable. We have four different types of goods resulting from that. We have the problem of each one, how each one creates a market failure, whether it be collapse, exhaustion of the resource, whether it be free riders resulting in that good or service being underprovided, or whether it be a club good where it's just, ah, it's tough to kind of jumble this price to make it equal to marginal social cost. We have our situations that cause market failures. In each case, we also have our solution. To work back in the other way, club goods, you need variable pricing. It should be free when it's not congested. As demand surges, so should the price. For public goods, you need to have a strong government to kind of say, hey, look, guys, you're not going to do it on your own. We'll do it for you because it's in your own best interest. That's tough, though, right? That's tough. It can also be politically unpopular, even though in the end they'll be happier because of it. Common resource goods, we tend to overutilize it. So how do we fix it? We assign a price to what would otherwise be a free resource. And that price that we assign, that is typically known as a royalty, a tax. So are four different types of goods. Only one of them is allocatively efficient. The other three create issues and we've looked at the correction or the way that we could correct each one as well. If you have any questions about these goods, feel free to reach out to me, reach out through D2L, reach out through email, be more than happy to answer any questions. Till next time.